very first RSA. I had nine months in the cybersecurity industry. Uh, it's probably less than every one of you individually, so I reserve the right to change my mind next time I should help over here. This is my disclaimer. Um, I've had the opportunity to walk the floor yesterday, and it's amazing to see the level of enthusiasm, the level of excitement, the level of innovation out there. So congratulations. It's a phenomenally charged industry. The reason I got extra attracted to this industry to come work here is because of the true mission-driven nature of what all of us do. And we're all trying to make the world a better place. We're all trying to protect our customers, whether they're enterprises or consumers. I think that's an amazing mission for all of us to aspire to. I've had the opportunity over the last nine months to go out and talk to people like yourself, talk to our customers, talk to practitioners of cybersecurity. And what's fascinating is, you know, they keep seeing an onslaught of more and more products. More and more products from our industry that solve particular solutions. And as uh, uh, Anne said earlier, you know, they're really looking at, they're really there to find more comprehensive solutions as opposed to point solutions for their, for their products. The second observation which I have, which I found very fascinating, this is an industry where more money is spent on services, less money is spent on products. In about $145 billion industry, over $80 billion is spent on services, and close to $60 plus billion is spent on products. That's interesting. I also, like I had the opportunity to talk to many of our customers in the last three days. And what's fascinating is, I'd say over the last few years, if you ask the same question to them, they'll say, the number of cybersecurity vendors slash solutions in the enterprise has gone up, not down. And I said, does that make you feel any more secure? The answer is, I'm not sure. Just kind of upside down. It looks like if we do maybe more innovation in these halls, in these rooms, our customers find more solutions, we should be leaving them with a more, with a higher sense of security. Now, I think the average customer uh, feels they're not more secure. They are obviously going to feel more secure than they were. And my third observation is that there's this wonderful being called a SOC analyst. And what has happened in the last three to five years is the more solutions we've spun out in our customers, the harder the job of a SOC analyst has become. And we're beginning to talk about a skills shortage because there's not enough people to keep track of all the cybersecurity solutions that we're deploying into the customer's infrastructure. So the challenge we have collectively is how do we make our customers feel more secure? How do we create more comprehensive security? How do we create a situation where we make life easier for our friends in the SOC, not harder? And I think one of the buzzwords, or the key words you're going to hear from us, is more integration. The industry needs more integration. It needs more of our solutions to work together better. The more our solutions work together better, the life will be made a lot simpler and easier for our friends in the SOC. So this is not a cybersecurity speech for me, not yet. We'll wait another few hours to get there, because I'm pretty sure each of you can take me and give me a better speech. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to invite my friend Jay Shree from Arista, and we're going to talk about what it takes to be nimble and adaptable and disruptive in industries. Uh, before I do that, I thought I'd give you a quick background about myself. I grew up uh, as part of an Indian Air Force family. Uh, my parents were always moving every few years. We were brought up with very high integrity, always trying to get the right thing done. And as part of moving everywhere, you have to build a sense of adaptability and a sense of nimbleness. I have, I've had the pri privilege of working in India, in Japan, in Germany, in England, in Silicon Valley, in Austin. So I've had to pick up and move and reestablish my life. I've worked as a money manager. I've worked as a guy selling advertising at the other big tech company called Google. Uh, I've managed money for SoftBank. I've done product development for T-Mobile. So, Constantly, I've had to change. The only constant in my life has been change. And Jeffrey is a similar person. She uh, was born in England. She grew up uh, between New Delhi and Chennai. She moved to the US. Uh, she went to school here. She's worked for many, many leading companies in the Bay Area uh, until she became CEO of Arista. But she's managed very capably and uh, taken it public and still continues to beat everybody out there with the constant uh, array of new products and amazing execution. 
Eucharist. So with that, please join me in welcoming Jeshu Allah.
Uh, Arista is very much a company built by technologists, built by engineers, for engineers. So a lot of the initial formation of Arista was to actually surround ourselves with like-minded culture and like-minded thinking, because you don't want to spend a lot of time debating you know, the color of the sky or how you build products. Or, so the understanding was fundamental. And I think um, initially when you're in a startup phase, it's very important. Now, as you get to become, and, you know, if you, if, you, if you will, as you start to go from being a, a, a baby to a teenager to an adolescent to an adult, you have to adapt. To the cult. But the culture is the one thing I think you bind and keep strong. But as you scale, you have to bring in different players. And they may be a phase two to Arista or phase two to Palo Alto Networks with the arrival of you, where you think about not just how do you build great people, but how do you build great leadership and leaders? So there's a difference between managing and leading, as you well know. And you all would be very surprised to hear, for example, in our sales leadership, uh, we don't have a quota system. We don't measure folks by how well they do on a given quarter. Can you beat your numbers? And of course, our investors do, so that's a different problem. But our fundamental lessons. Oh, so let's, let's analyze that a little more. <laughs> okay. Uh, I didn't know that. Security show, you know, so we okay, have. No, trust me. There's a lot of disruptive entrepreneurs, and they're all looking to get escape velocity and go sell more so that their companies get more revenues. There's VCs around here trying to figure out how to buy. So I'm pretty sure a lot of these smart people here have got companies they want to take to escape velocity. They're all thinking, let's go find a good salesperson. Let's make sure they have a target. Let's make sure they build that target. So do that again. How do you run your company without well, telling our, people? Well, our fundamental premise is customers don't have quotas. They have budgets. They don't spend them by our quota boundaries. So do the right thing. Now, that doesn't mean they don't have a target, and that doesn't mean they don't go ambitiously looking uh, for numbers, but... They have a target and no quota. No, no quota and no accelerators, and they don't get to go play golf after they're done with a particular part of the month or the year. And so it's keep doing the right thing, keep being in front of customers. Um, and, you know, another example of that would be sometimes it means you uh, have to take back product. We had a very big crisis one time with one of our chip vendors where they had a soft error problem. And it literally cost the company its uh, not only its profitability but its viability. But we chose to go retrofit. And to this day, those customers remember us for doing that, uh, and, and therefore reinforcing our bar for quality. So I think the culture again to how you define success, not just by today's metrics or immediate results, but taking the long term and building that foundation is very fundamental to I think uh, uh, leadership. And every culture, every company has its culture. Ours is very much customer and technology. Now, uh, Nikesh, I know you believe, and I believe, as you just said, many products are very key, right? And now, what, what less lessons have you learned about what customers have to do to embrace this disruption? You can build the winning products, but how do you get them to customers? And what do you think their best interests are when you push them that hard or too hard? Well, uh, look, I think uh, one thing I learned when I was at Google and the founder of Google. Larry, uh, when he became CEO, he, he transformed his management team. Uh, I used to run the business side, so he said, look, business is all wonderful, but if you look at the history of Silicon Valley, no company has become great by having great, just a great sales guy. The greatest companies are built on amazing products. So he actually reorganized the staff and for all the product leaders who worked with him, and for all the business people who worked with me, saying, I just want this person, but I can sell product leaders who did how each of those products win. And, you know, in contrast, he was advised by his teacher of not to focus very carefully on a set of products, one product, uh, but both of them did have this commonality where they believed having a great product was the beginning of building a great company, a great business. And I fundamentally believe that if your products work, uh, they can demonstrate value to the customers, that's your calling card. Yes, you can you can have a gap for three months, six months, where you you know people buy your brand, your promise, but you cannot constantly go out there and convince customers that your product will eventually get there. So, products are the most important thing in what we all do for a living. Uh, and if you have a good product, you will find customers who understand the value chain, you will find the value of them, you will see the benefits, you will find the through word of mouth telling their other colleagues in the industry. And I'm pretty sure you've experienced that with your product. Yeah, and, and, now, you know, and often I'm in front of customers who speak about your products and probably vice versa. So word of mouth is a very powerful yeah. communication vehicle. Yeah. So Jesse, I have a question. Um, you talk about customers and pushing them hard. Um, can you talk about some more stories? What have you learned from your customers in the 
you talked about pushing them hard. You obviously talked about the situation where you had to bring your product back because you had retrofitted, which clearly creates tremendous amounts of both credibility, reputation, integrity in the company. But for example, customer sold to people. That's funny, I just came out of a customer event. We, we don't do a big trade show. We bring uh, 200 of our top intimate customers. And I ask them this question every year, and I say, what do you like most about our company? And I expect to hear some great technology <laughs> they'll drive. And the, the two, and of course, they think of us as a very innovative company, and as you said, innovation is fundamental. But then one thing they keep telling me is, we love your quality and service. It's great that you've given us our weekends back, and you know we don't go from being a zero to a zero in front of our management. So I think that's something, the foundation of an architecture has got to be so innovative that you're not just building silos and security or silos in a cloud infrastructure, but you can actually guarantee them that kind of quality. And that's easy said than done, because if you build a lot of you know, kludgy stacks, then you're going to have a lot of inner process interrupts, and you're not going to have that consistency. So that's something we hear a lot. Um, the, the other thing I think uh, we're very clear about with our customers, and they appreciate that often they don't like it, is our focus. I think it's very important in our industries to say who we are, and like you said, say who we're not and who we're part of it. So, you know, if, for example, in the business case, we were focused very much on high frequency trading, we moved to cloud networking, and our customers kept saying, you need to do routing, I need this product to do routing. And I've had to actually annoy customers by saying, no, we won't, we're not ready for that. And then, of course, five years later, we have come back and we have come back and built partnerships with you to do the right macro and micro level segmentation along with your products. And now we've, you know, we, we have come back and moved and driven this even more into the IoT and campus. So I think being customer driven, being technology driven, but having a good balance of focus of what you do and not do, I think has helped us change the industry, but do so in a, in a phased manner. Amazing. So, um, you know, you, you asked me how do I think of a, a phased industry. I'd like to learn from you on what's your rule of thumb. Uh, when is an idea big enough? Because everybody will point to these large tents that are the billions and say you've got to go for it. So how do you decide when you're sitting in front of a big, large idea when you're going to pursue it or not? You know, it's a, it's a fascinating conversation. So one of the, there's been a lot of soul searching going on within our company in terms of, you know, where does our product fit in the market? There's a debate, firewalls are dead, there's a better pair of lines, people are going to say the firewalls are going to go away. I have bad news for people that firewalls are not going to go away. They're going to be around for a while. They're going to do more and more things in your infrastructure. But there will be a move to the cloud, so that has to be thought about. Um, part of what, you know, the thinking we're trying to adapt is the more innovative you are, the more disruptive you are, you probably don't understand the time of the market. Now, if you take the example of the, the consumer industry, I'm pretty sure Uber or Lyft had a ban which was the taxi companies, and that's not a very attractive plan. But they built a whole new market because they created a service which is way better than the existing market. So the question is, are there things we can do which allow us to build a new large plan? And I think there's a huge opportunity in our industry, in automation, and, and Anne talked about AI and ML. Uh, there's a huge opportunity in our industry to automate a lot of things which allows us to make life easier for the customer, makes them get better outcomes from a security perspective, also attacks the skills shortage issue we talked about. So we think there are a few TAMs that will get created in our lifetime in security, so we're trying to figure out what those TAMs are going to be. You know, I like to use the word YAM, and it shouldn't be total available market, it should be your available market, right? So. Well, YAMs and TAMs. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so, you know, the one question which I do have to ask you, Jeffrey, you know, Anne talked about this in her previous presentation about inclusive diversity. Uh, I think Palo Alto, we've just seen after values, you know, front and center of our values is inclusivity and diversity. The industry doesn't have enough of that in terms of, if you look at the, the way the industry is structured. Uh, can you give me some tips and all of us some tips on how to create <laughs> more uh, inclusivity and diversity? Well, how many, how many women in the audience are supporting right now? Can you all raise your hands so they can't see? Well, that tells you the amount of diversity we have. If you look at diversity as as gender, you know, we've got a long ways to go. If you look at diversity as inclusion of different thoughts and different types of people, I think Silicon Valley is totally a value for. We've done a lot of good work there. But you have two daughters, I have two daughters. It starts in middle school and high school, guys. I mean, you have to inculcate the interest in technology, the interest in math, and 
I was fortunate to be interested in that. My dad started the IITs. I was not good at needlework and drawing and some of the more traditionally accepted norms in, in the community I came from. So in some ways, I was a misfit uh, in, in the classic uh, gender sense. But I think it starts there. Now, um, at Aristo, we, we are a living example of diversity because my CFO is female, and, and obviously I am too. So our earnings calls, um, they, they get to say thank you ladies quite often. Um, for, you know, it's, it's a real refreshing change for them and for us here too. So I think leading by example, encouraging, and then we talked about shortage of skills. This is a really important place to tackle, both from a diversity and the type of people. Because I believe, for example, when we hire an experienced engineer, sometimes we have to undo their habits because they've learned bad habits. So bringing in the right diversity and bringing them in early so that you can give them the right training. And two, you know, a few years ago, nobody knew Python or Golang or any you know, old programming on C++ or Java. So this retooling is a very unique opportunity to include diversity and think different. And, and finally, I'm going to say something on, on the account of women here. I think that it's also not, a, not just an inclusion of technical ability, but a different way of thinking uh, that can be embraced, which is often intuitive, it's instinct, and not all the time you need data to make a conclusion, and I think uh, the female gender contributes greatly there. So uh, all of this, I think, uh, is a good thing, but on the other hand, I think we need both. We need, we need a nice mix of competent people, men and women. I agree with that. On that, on that note, uh, I just want to say it's the most exciting time to in this industry. Uh, we're all lucky because we always get new problems to solve because there's a bunch of bad guys trying to get around us and trying to get around all the good stuff we've done. It's been a fantastic industry, amazing time to be in it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for having me and Jay Shear. Jay Shear, thank you very much for your Thank you. It's a lot of fun. Thanks, guys.